China is one of the biggest countries in the world and has extremely diverse geography. Hence, it has a few geostrategic weaknesses and strength. For example, strength are the floodplain of the Yellow River and more broadly, the entirety of eastern China is incredibly suited to agriculture. China in its current geographic form is largely secure against overland invasion thanks to its control over buffer regions in the northeast, north, west and northwest. It has a wealth of natural resources, it has a 9,000 mile long coastline conducive to maritime trade, fishing and the development of sea power. I would go as far to say it has one of the best geographies in the world. But let's talk about its geographical weaknesses, because by the end of this video you might think China's geography completely sucks, and perhaps it will change the way you see China. So in this three-part series, we will take on China's geographic weaknesses, so please subscribe and hit the bell button not to miss upcoming episodes. I promise it's gonna be very interesting. China's geography can be understood as consisting of a Han core, which can be classified as China proper, and a shell of buffer region that encloses it from the north and west. The 15-inch isohyet encompasses the area of China that receives 15 or more inches of rainfall per year and is thus capable of supporting substantial agricultural activity and hence people. As you can see, much of the population is concentrated in the regions south of the Isohyet because the climate is very conducive to growing crops. The Isohyet therefore delimits, as it has for centuries, China's demographic core and by extension, its political core. Historically, geographical barriers, inhospitable terrain, and most importantly, the Isohyet have impeded the expansion of the Han core. No rain means no crops, no crops mean an inability to sustain large populations. Hence, the demographic and political reach of the core remains constrained to the south of the Isohyet. This perhaps explains the preservation of the non-Han cultural and ethnic identities existing in the buffer regions beyond the core. It's not a coincidence that the Great Wall parallels the Isohyet. It was only fortifying what nature had created. The core can definitely project power and influence beyond the Isohyet, but for Chinese civilization to take root, to settle in the form of people and cities beyond this line, that's a real challenge. As an array of strategic buffers shield the core, consisting of Tibet in the west, Xinjiang in the northwest, Inner Mongolia in the north, and Manchuria in the northeast. Retaining control of the buffer regions has been an eternal geostrategic imperative for China. The Han core was extremely vulnerable to nomadic raids and incursions from the plains and steppes of the north and northeast. Case in point, the Mongols and the Mancho conquered and ruled China because the flat terrain is practically an invitation for conquests by nomadic horsemen. In the west, the Himalayas presented a formidable barrier, but northwestern China, the interface for the ancient Silk Road, was where the fringes of the empire met the kingdoms of Central Asia and the influence of the Islamic world. Tibet was still particularly irritating because it was easier for Tibetans to ride down and raid the Chinese villages than for the Chinese to climb the mountains and conquer them. In modern times, if control of Tibet was lost, India could move across the Himalayas and establish a base of operations on the plateau. Chinese history was therefore expressed as cycles where a strong core with its various instruments of national power, including military, economic and cultural, and it systematically asserts and maintains control over the borderlands and thus secures the empire, or where a weak core is simply unable to impose its will on the buffers and so remains constrained to its own territory of China proper. In any case, control over or influence of the buffers was a security imperative. It provided defensible borders and anchored the empire. Without the buffers, the core would be exposed, soft, vulnerable, dense, massed with stationary populations of farmers ripe for plunder. So historically, Chinese dynasties sought to accommodate, influence and assimilate the buffer region with complex diplomacy and tributary systems rather than forcibly control them, though they sometimes did forcibly control. 
They were considered semi-integrated and semi-autonomous, so the objective was to ensure that these regions, their population and policies did not threaten the security of the core, or that foreign adversary or invaders did not do so through them. The disposition of the borderland policies and people had a direct effect on Chinese national security. Now the Chinese communist government is strong and it formally controls the buffer regions, so this is not much of a weakness per se, on the contrary it's a strength, but it is a potential weakness because it has been an Achilles heel of China for thousands of years. Notably, three of the four buffer regions mentioned earlier are categorized as autonomous regions. This is primarily due to their distinct ethnic, cultural, and religious non-Han identity, which has been a source of tension for much of Chinese history. As you can see, the populations that inhabit and have historically inhabited the buffer regions are distinct from the Han population of the core in their ethnicity, culture, and the languages that they speak. In this sense, they pose a challenge in terms of national cohesion and inter-ethnic and cultural relations. In more recent times, Beijing has encouraged the settlement of Han Chinese into the buffer regions to dilute their demographic and ethnic composition. This has become a source of friction between the central government in the core and the people of the autonomous regions. Demographic tensions between the core and the periphery are exacerbated by the economic and developmental disparities and what might be perceived as economic exploitation of the region's natural resources. Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region has been an uneasy borderland since Uyghur people are Turkic Muslims and close to Central Asian people like Uzbeks, like yours truly, there have been a number of ethnic tensions in the region. So the Chinese government does not want any problems in its eastern buffer, and it's so brutal and dystopian that over 1 million Chinese government workers began forcibly living in the homes of Uyghur families to monitor and assess resistance to assimilation, as well as spy on Uyghur people if they are practicing their religion at home. So from this, you can see how important are the buffers and inter-ethnic stability to Chinese government, that they are ready for everything, even wipe out an entire local nation for its security. Aside from its geostrategic value as a buffer, there is another, a perhaps more important reason why China must control Tibet. This has to do with water security. The Tibetan Plateau is the source of China's major rivers. The whole agricultural productivity of the Han core stems from the old water that comes down from the highlands. Therefore, China's food security is also dependent on its control of Tibet. Foreign control of the sources of the Yellow and Yangtze rivers would be unacceptable. The occupying power would have its hands in the throat of the Chinese nation. There was a German military advisor to Imperial Japan who described Korea as a dagger pointed at the heart of Japan. I think the same expression could be reliably applied with regard to China and its security. The Korean Peninsula served as an invasion route for Japanese forces as early as 1590s. In the Imjin War, the Ming Emperor sent troops to beat back the samurai advancing up the peninsula and again later by Imperial Japan during the First Sino-Japanese War. The 1950 Korean War served as another reminder of Korea's crucial position as a potential springboard for foreign incursions. When US-led forces advanced towards the Yalu River, the Chinese found them too close for comfort and intervened. In a sense, the Korean Peninsula is a mini buffer of sorts, an extension of Manchuria jutting out into the East China, invitingly towards the southern tip of Japan, a bridgehead for the invasion of Manchuria and the Chinese heartland by foreign forces. But while the Chinese were able to consolidate control over Manchuria, the peninsula's mountainous terrain, the Kayama Plateau, 
and Hamkyong Mountains provide a strong barrier on the northern border. Its mountainous terrain allowed Korean kingdoms to retain their nominal independence. Right now, this is made even messier by a nuclear North Korea and the legacy of post-war partition. There is also the issue of ethnic Koreans within China and their identity in relation to a unified Korean state, even if it comes about. This episode is brought to you with the help of these Patreon supporters. If you want to support this channel, head over to Patreon and thanks to everyone who's supporting. Thanks for watching. This is the first part of the Chinese Geographical Weaknesses series. The next video is coming up soon, so please subscribe not to miss the upcoming episodes.